he went carnivore and he was telling me how wonderful he felt and he lost weight and everything. And I made a note in his chart so I could ask him about it the next time I saw him. So six months later, um, I saw him and I asked him, how's the diet going? And he goes, oh, he goes, I, I had to, I had to quit. I said, oh, why'd you have to quit? And he said, oh, my cholesterol went up and my do my doctor was not happy. And he's like, yep. He goes, and it's awful. He goes, I, I gained 20 pounds. He goes, I feel terrible. I'm tired. I just feel miserable. And he just, so he, he went from feeling amazing, you know, eating carnivore to, and then to make his doctor happy. Now he's gaining weight and feeling terrible. Gina, how did you find carnivore? Um, probably like a lot of people out of desperation. Um, the shorter answer is, uh, after reading a blog post called the, uh, why I'm no longer vegan by the peasant's daughter. And it was, I just randomly found it doing like a Google search about, um, former vegans, ex vegans. And this article was, was beautifully written. It was long. It was very long. She actually included chapters and, um, it, it documented her journey of, um, her family was not, you know, um, from America. And I don't know if they might've even been Canadian, but I can't really remember, but, um, immigrants and they had a specific diet as a child. And then what she went through it when she got older and, uh, beca becoming a vegan and then the health issues she had, and then eventually finding meat. And she spoke of the health benefits of meat and the environmental benefits of me as well. And it was probably the first time I had really thought about meat being healthy. I mean, always knew that meat had protein in it and, you know, that you should have it, you know, and at this point I was just coming off being vegan, but most of my life I always thought you should have meat mainly because of the protein more than anything. But there was always that underlying, underlying uh, red meat is, you know, bad for your heart. It's, you know, the saturated fat is bad. So it was probably the first time I'd ever heard anybody say that meat was healthy. And that was the rabbit, you know, rabbit trail to the rabbit hole of looking up carnival, looking up the health benefits of red meat, and then finding the, uh, all, you know, everything that everybody else finds, the doc Dr. Barry, Dr. Um, Baker, Dr. Chafee, and and not just the doctors, but um, the everyday regular people like yourself and um, carnivorous me, Amanda, and so many others, and seeing story after story, um, it drew me in. Um, prior to that, I had been uh, vegan for, well, I, I was actually not vegan at that point. I was probably not vegan for three or four months. And then prior to that, I was vegan for about 18 months. and. Um, and the reason I became a vegan was for health reasons. It was not ethical or anything. Um, I had building th through my forties, I started getting like chronic health issues, um, that were, you know, start off as like minor nu uh, nuisances that, you know, built over time into, you know, big, bigger and bigger problems. Um, but in my 20s, I went through the whole, um, you know, it was, it, that was early 90s. So that was the era of really super low fat um, eating. Um, there was a woman on daytime TV called, uh, her name was Susan Powder. She was the, the fat makes you fat lady. And I used to love watching her. <laughs> and uh, that was her big mantra, fat makes you fat. And uh, I got really into that, like really super low fat dieting in my 20s. Like that's the era of the, I can't believe it's not butter spray. And, um, you know, everybody switched over to skim milk and the snack well cookies and fake eggs and all that stuff. And, you know, dove into that, um, poured sugar on everything because sugar didn't have fat in it. So it was completely safe. <laughs> um, but you know, I mean, I would make meals, breakfast and lunch would be cornflakes with sugar and skim milk, you know, and then I would, at dinner would be large portions of pasta with the spray, the no fat spray on it. And, uh, you know, so that was, you know, my twenties, my thirties and forties pretty much stayed kind of low fat, maybe not that crazy strict, but, you know, always followed the, the, uh, food pyramid. Um, and was always active. So I never had a problem with my weight. Um, but 
into my 30s and then into my 40s, some health issues started developing. I started kind of having bouts with vertigo, um, anxiety. I started developing anxiety. Um, my late 40s, uh, I started getting really bad episodes of fatigue. My legs would feel like they were stuck in cement. Um, they would be tingling. And there was one point where um, I actually went through testing for um, MS because I started having vision problems in one eye. You know, I had all those kind of symptoms of autoimmune, but they, they never found anything. They did a lot of testing, but they never really found anything. Um, and then also my IBS started getting worse and worse and worse. And um, that was really interfering with life. Um, I'm a dental hygienist and I work really close with patients all day long. And so it's really hard to have people, you know, physically close to you within inches and then worrying about stomach problems, whether you got to run to the bathroom or whether you got to pass gas or, you know, and it made it really hard. Um, I remember if I was taking uh, someone's x-ray and, you know, I have to stand and place the x-ray in their mouth. And if I get that wave of like, oh no, you know, my stomach is going to do something. And I, so I would just stand there and start small talk, you know, so what do you think of this weather? You know, it's, you know, do you think we're going to get rain? You know, try to talk a few minutes until that feeling would pass. And then I could run out of the room, take the x-ray, run back in. But it was, it was getting, it was getting to the point where I thought about quitting my job. And um, so as I was right after I were, um, went through all the testing for MS, um, I tried to figure out how to, um, just try to get back to health. You know, um, I was a runner, but then I would have to quit running because my health issues would build up and then I'd stop running and then I'd get frustrated. And it was a cycle of, you know, trying to get healthier, but, you know, would run for a little while and have to stop. And, um, so I decided that I really had to figure out my diet. Like maybe if I could really, um, fix my diet because I did go through a period too, where I kind of ate really crummy too. I had a standard American diet at, you know, various points too. And, uh, I said, well, it could be diet. Maybe I just really need to tweak my diet, get it really well, good. And, um, my running partner is vegan. So, and everywhere you look, everyone's vegan. So, um, just sounded like that's the way to go. So I tried that and I did that for 18 months. And, um, probably in the beginning, things got somewhat better, you know, because I started eliminating all the, the garbage I had been eating, but eventually things really kind of went downhill. Um, I, my stomach issues kept getting worse and worse. Then I started developing gallbladder problems. I started getting a, a, a acute gallbladder attacks, pain. Um, it was like right in the center of my stern, just below my sternum. And it would go right straight through, through to my back. And, um, I would get afraid of food because I kept trying, you know, kind of tying it to certain food. Like I thought maybe I ate this and then it caused the, the attack and it got to the point where I was afraid of food. So I like dropped like 10 pounds within like a month because I was afraid of eating. Um, I've been afraid of eating because of the IBS, um, you know, made for a very, tough relationship with food because I felt like it was always, always giving me trouble. Um, so I kept trying to stick with the, the vegan diet. I kept playing around with it. Um, I figured, well, maybe I'm somebody who's sensitive to, um, beans. So maybe I should really be careful with what, you, what kind of beans and, and maybe I'm, you know, I kept picking apart parts of the diet that maybe just was unique to me. And, um, everything that I tweaked and moved around and played with, it just, it never really worked. And uh, then the fatigue started getting really bad. And I didn't know it at the time, but I was developing um, anemia, really bad anemia. Um, that's why th at that point I was feeling really bad fatigue. And um, I would go out and try to go run and I couldn't get more, you know, a mile and I'd be out of breath and winded and panting. And I woke up in the middle of the night one night and my heart was pounding so fast. I could feel it hitting the mattress. And, uh, and then I woke up panting. And so I went to urgent care and 
they, you know, they found out I was very, I was anemic and they said that I, if I got any worse, I probably should go to the ER and there really wasn't much they could do for me at the urgent care. And so the next night I went to uh, the emergency room and they wanted to give me a blood transfusion. And, um, I, I did not want to do that. So I, luckily I had, um, an appointment coming up. So I was able to get into a hematologist. I got four weekly iron infusions. And when I told the hematologist, well, he was trying to figure out why I was so anemic and he was asking me different questions. And he did ask me about my diet and I told him I was vegan. He goes, well, there it is. <laughs> like he, he, he pinned it on my vegan diet. So, and I was mad at the time. Cause I was like, oh, what does he know? You know? And, uh, but, um, so I, in my mind, I was still thinking it, it really was not tied to my diet, any of my health issues. It was just me. I was just one of those people with bad luck, bad genes. And um, so after the iron infusions and everything and still feeling pretty crummy, I kind of went through a period of just kind of giving up on food. And I said, well, I'm just going to eat whatever I want. Um, you know, I've tried to eat healthy and I still feel terrible. So, so then I went back to kind of standard American diet, um, binging on things and, you know, eating whatever I wanted and still going downhill, feeling terrible. Um, IBS was getting really bad and it was just, I had a period of time where I had, like I said, about six months of eating regular diet still felt bad. And then I said, oh, again, I'm like, I got to fix my diet. I got to do it. I got to get back. And then I'm like, I got to get back to vegan. I got to go back to plant-based. I got to get healthy again. That's the healthy way to do it. And I was ready to start going back. And one of the things that held me up is I did not feel like doing all that cooking because <laughs> there's a lot of prep work with vegan you know, meals. And I was just like exhausted thinking about even prepping so um, I was just like doing, I'll just do vegetables and rice. You know, that's real simple. I'll just do that. And I was ready to go back to vegan. And um, somehow I just got it in my head to, to start looking up um, and ex-vegan stories. I don't know how, where the step came from, but I started looking into um, people would post things online, articles and videos and I started reading their stories and they talked about the health issues they had and why they had to give it up. And uh, I started really, um, really thinking about it and finding the carnivore doctors in the carnivore space. And it sounded crazy to me. It really did. It sounded absolutely bananas. And, um, and I kind of knew who Dr. Baker was before uh, carnivore, I'd seen him do some kind of non carnivore, uh, like political kind of videos. And I always liked his political content. And then I found out that he was a big proponent of a uh, meat diet. And I'm like, he, I, he's really smart, but he's eating a crazy diet. <laughs> but um, uh, just, you know, kept learning and taking everything in. And just like everyone else, you know, you go from extremely skeptical, thinking that this is nuts, to what do I have to lose? You know? And, um, so I, I did, I went slow. I did not jump right in feet first, like a lot of people. So I just started adding more meat and taking things out. And I think that helped me because I never got the keto flu. I never, um, had any moments, you know, bad, uh, digestion or anything. And, um, so maybe six weeks, eight weeks of, building up meat and reducing everything else. And once I got to the point where I was, I was carnivore, I, I really could not believe the the absolute turnaround in my health. Um, the other thing I didn't mention either is a uh, bone and joint pain. I was having a lot of too. Um, like it would scare me. Like I would think I would start Googling, uh, bone cancer and stuff because it hurt so bad. I'd wake up in the morning, every joint would ache, every bone would ache. I went through a period where I had like, I think it was frozen shoulder, like one shoulder got really stuck and I couldn't move it. Then the other one did. So, um, and all that went away, that went away. Um, the, my anxiety went away that I would never would have expected. I just figured I am, that's my personality. I'm just, I have anxiety. That's who I am. I never would imagine that went away. 
um, uh, energy galore. But, you know, my most excited, they're all blow me away. They all make me super happy. But I guess probably the IBS is my most, the one I, I'm excited about the most because that had the biggest impact on my life. Just, it's a, it's weird to say, but you spend all day thinking about what your stomach is doing and, you know, whether or not you have social gathering later in the day and you're like, I'm going to be around people. Am I going to be, you know, gassy and, you know, whatever. It's stupid, but and you think about it all day long, you know, what, whatever I start to eat. And I think, well, in about 45 minutes, I'm going to start having some issues and who am I going to be around? And it's it, all day long, just all day long thinking about what my stomach was doing and um, running to the bathroom and all that. And for that to be just like nothingness, just nothing going on. I don't, I feel nothing. <laughs> and, um, that's just weird. It's just weird and delightful. <laughs> um, and actually, it's kind of funny. I don't know if this is TMI, but um, I had to actually figure out how to listen to my body to go to the bathroom because I was so used to dire, run for your life, got to go to the bathroom now kind of signals. And now it's just a little bit of like a little whisper, like maybe you should run to the bathroom or you should, you should go to the bathroom. And it's, ve it's very minimal. So like, sometimes I can almost ignore that because I'm so used to not, you know, it, I was used to ignoring little grumblings and rumblings. And uh, so now I actually have to, to key in a little bit and, and recognize that, the, you know, the tiniest little thing is, Oh, okay. All right. It's time to go to the bathroom. <laughs> but, um, so that's been, awesome. Um, yeah, no more joint pain, um, energy, which has been a blessing because, um, I needed not only, I was not in a position to quit work, um, but we wanted to send my son to a private school, which meant I had to start working more and there was no way I was going to be able to pick up more hours feeling the way I did then. And so now I've been able to work pretty close to full time, and still come home, go, you know, I go to the gym. Um, I just started playing pickleball. Um, I just, you know, getting back into hiking. Like I've, I'm going all the time and I have energy that I haven't had in, you know, decades. So it's been a, it's been a, a great journey and I'm a huge proponent of it now. I can't stop talking about it with people. I know people are sick of hearing it from me. I can't, but you have, everybody talks about this. You have this um, like awakening to kind of everything, the medical field, pharmaceuticals, um, just it, it's sad to look around at what people are going through, uh, food addiction, everything. It all becomes kind of crystal clear to you, um, especially with my patients. I, ha I see between eight and 11 patients a day and I'm I know their health history. I have to know it for, for treating them. And I see all the medications they're on and I see uh, everything they're dealing with. And 90% of the people come in are so unhealthy. And uh, I have some interesting conversations with patients because, you know, I try to talk to them about diet and um, a, a few people. Um, so I've met one woman so far who was carnivore. Um, and we had a great time talking about it actually. No, and then there was a gentleman, which this is an interesting story. He, um, he went carnivore and he was telling me how wonderful he felt and he lost weight and everything. And I made a note in his chart so I could ask him about it the next time I saw him. So six months later, um, I saw him and I asked him, how's the diet going? And he goes, Oh, he goes, I, I had to, I had to quit. I said, Oh, why'd you have to quit? And he said, oh, my cholesterol went up and my do my doctor was not happy. And he's like, yep. He goes, and it's awful. He goes, I, I gained 20 pounds. He goes, I feel terrible. I'm tired. I just feel miserable. And he just, so he, he went from feeling amazing, you know, eating carnivore to, and then to make his doctor happy. Now he's gaining weight and feeling terrible. And uh, so, of course, that set me on a whole path of talking about cholesterol with him and everything. And there, but then I've had other patients who come in and they'll tell me, oh, I had a woman who had um, vertigo really bad. 
and it was really interfering with her the, her quality of, quality of life and she was commiserating about it and just telling me how bad she felt and i said you know i used to have vertigo too really bad it was awful it would interfere with my job and i said but i said i don't have it anymore it's gone i got rid of it and she got very excited and she perked up and she asked how i did it and i you know told her what i did and she was defeated she's like oh uh, i could never do that and I'm always amazed at people who choose their chronic suffering and illness in order to be able to eat food that, that they, you know, they delight in or whatever. That momentary, whatever, mouth pleasure is more important to them than feeling better. You know, you, they'll tell me on one hand how, how terrible this, whatever it is, is bothering them, but yet they can't do that to make it better. And that kind of blows me away. I, I always wonder about that, you know, is that, is that like the, the mouth pleasure thing, the, the addiction, or is, is that like this feeling at the back of their mind that, uh, no, it's just not going to work for me. There's no mm -hmm. even thinking about it or do you, or is it a bit of both? What, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I think it's a bit of both. I, I, mm -hmm. but I really think. I think people are have it's more of addiction uh, of an addiction than we realize um, because everything revolves around food. Emotion is tied to food. You know, our, our celebrations are tied to food. Um, and, you know, I've had moments like that myself because um, my husband and myself and my son, we are always kind of consider ourselves foodies. So we always would, you know, we like to go out to dinner and try different foods and try different different ethnic foods and all that. And, um, so there was a little part of me that was sad that I could no longer really partake in that. Um, so the, you know, there's a big emotional part. There's, um, it's societal. It's just, it's so ingrained in, in everything that it is hard to let go of. So it's addiction, it's doubt in the person's self doubt maybe too. Yeah, I think it's a little bit of everything. Yeah. So how long has it been for you now that, that you've been carnival? Um, 18 months. Mm -hmm. 18 months. Yeah. Um, and in that 18 months, um, you, you talked about how, you know, you, you and family used to go out and, and try different foods and stuff. How have family reacted over the last 18 months? Um, very supportive very because they, you know, they know I'm feeling much better and they're very supportive. And I've got my husband's wheels spinning too. I mean, he's not carnivore. He's a big meat eater. He loves meat, but he also loves pizza and, you know, um, but I, I, you know, he'll send me things now. Like he'll send me little videos of people talking about seed oils or people talking about, um, diabetes and, you know, the link to, carbohydrates and so it's it's exciting for me to see him kind of starting to down that road to thinking about it um but uh so i have three kids and my son is still at home he's he would he's gonna be 16 in june and he's thinking about moving to like keto ketovore ish and he's been moving in that direction uh, he again has his same little foods that he loves you know again it's like pizza and things like that um but he's been moving in that direction and um he's really cleaned up his diet he doesn't snack anymore as you know there's i don't buy anything anymore so it's kind of hard for him to do it anyway but <laughs> um we have no potato chips in the house and what you know we used to get these like flavored popcorns and you know candy oh, none of that stuff is in the house so basically the only time he's eating is for meals and it's it's been really good for him too because um he's slimmed down a lot and uh and he knows too that it would help him you know because he has a little bit of anxiety and, and and some issues along those lines and he knows like from everything i've told him and he's heard some of the videos he's listened along with me and he knows that it helps with those things so he wants to move in that direction as well and then i have two grown daughters who are very happy for me but i can't quite convince them to get there <laughs> nice um so how how are you eating day to day how many meals and what are they made up of um i i, I think i'm unique i still eat three meals a day 
Um, probably because I've never been a big volume eater. I can't eat a lot in one setting. And plus, um, I don't have a gallbladder anymore. Um, so the, all those gallbladder attacks ultimately ended up in me having it removed. And um, so I, I've heard that Sometimes you can't eat a lot of large volume anyway, especially a lot of fat in one sitting. So, so I've been moving more towards two meals a day though lately in the last month or so, mainly because to try to work it around my schedule, the way I work and everything. Um, sometimes two meals are all, all I really can get in. If I know that, then I try to make my lunch a bigger meal. Um, I always eat breakfast. I'm just a breakfast person. I've, I've always loved breakfast. So I have um, four eggs uh, over easy every morning and I melt a little butter and um, goat cheese. It mix it all in and that's my breakfast. Um, I do drink coffee. That's my only non-carnivore uh, thing. I have coffee with heavy cream and butter in it. And uh, so I have that in the morning and then um, lunch I eat bring a little container that had that kind of warms food and i usually put some hamburger patties in that with some butter and dinner will usually be hamburger or um my favorite ribeye that's everybody's favorite right <laughs> and uh ribeye or strip steaks i really like strip steaks too um salmon once in a while um i'm not super big on chicken but i'll eat it once in a while um bacon once in a while but, you know, beef and eggs and butter and a little bit of cheese, well, the goat cheese every day. But um, but sometimes I'll have some, uh, you know, cheddar cheese or whatever. And then some raw milk occasionally. I'm, I'm pretty blessed. I'm, I live very close to a, a farm that sells raw milk. So um, we, my son drinks a lot of that. And then, you know, I have occasional glasses too. Does when you're having lunch at work, does anyone ever say to you, "What is it that you have against vegetables?" Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Um, they, you know, they always say, you know, like, you know, they say, "Oh, you only eat meat, or you eat no carbs," and they're like, "But you eat vegetables, though, right?" <laughs> no, 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 no vegetables, really. You know, and you know, it's kind of a a weird conversation to start because I always try to figure out where to start with that to explain to them because it's kind of a long story in a way you know to explain to somebody you know their whole entire lives they've been told vegetables are good for you and and fruits good for you and all that so it's hard to explain to them why I do it sometimes it's easier to tell them that um, I have health issues and it you know for me that's what works and you do, do tell them that you could go you could do a meat-based diet and if if you can tolerate vegetables and that's what you want to do, you could totally do that. Cause sometimes I don't want people to think it's an all or nothing kind of thing. Like they've either got to go full hundred percent carnivore or just keep doing what they're doing, you know? Um, so, cause I have people tell me they love vegetables and I'm like, if you can tolerate them, but you know, eliminate the bread and eliminate all the other grains and the sugars and really up your meat, you know, you'll be way better, you know, much much better than you are yeah mm -hmm. um so at this stage i mean you're feeling a lot better um things like the anxiety have gone um can you see yourself doing this forever yes absolutely yep um i'm not opposed i've had handfuls of fruit here and there um that doesn't seem to bother my stomach um i do that um couple times a year i i'm i'm someone who can eat a little bit of a treat and not go over you know some people can't eat a little bit of sugar and you know because then they'll go overboard and that's it they'll it'll derail them <laughs> but um for me uh, i can have a sliver of a pie at thanksgiving um you know so like maybe three four times a year i have a little treat uh on holidays or birthdays but um as far as day-to-day -day life this is this is it for me because I'm, i'd be too afraid to go back to where i was you know i like sometimes i you know people say well maybe you can start reintroducing things and see how your body does and i've thought about that but i i get to um i'm like i just feel too good what happens if i start not feeling good again you know i just why well, don't fix it if it ain't broke <laughs> 
Yeah. Um, so you mentioned your job as a dental hygienist. Mm -hmm. um, so just thinking from that perspective, since you've been carnivore, do you find that, you know, your teeth are cleaner or you don't have to be as, I don't know, diligent about brushing or anything like that? Yeah, my, my teeth do feel cleaner. I still do my same routine. I'm, I'm, I still floss and, you know, once a day and brush twice a day and all that. Um, but you, you definitely can feel it like um, on a standard diet when you wake up in the morning and you rub your, run your tongue on your teeth, they'll feel like fuzzy. That's the plaque starting to build up. And I don't feel that. Like, my you know, if I wake up in the morning, they still feel smooth. If I putter around the house and forget to brush for a couple hours, they still feel smooth. Um, so, yeah. And I try to talk to patients about their diet, too, because, you know, cavities and uh, decay is so many people just have, like, really bad problems with that. And they'll do everything. They'll go, I don't understand. I brush. I floss. And I still get cavities. It's their diet. You know, it's the sugar in their diet. It's the carbs in their diet. And I, you know, and I tell people that it's not just people know that it's sugar and they'll say, I don't really eat that much sugar. I said, it's not just sugar. I, you know, it's crackers, it's um, pasta, it's bread. You know, those are the things that you're the bacteria in your mouth love to eat. So. Yeah. And, you know, this, the one of the scary things I've heard about when it comes to mouth health as well is that one of the bacterias or something that um, I, I don't remember the exact name, but one of the bacteria or um, whatever it happens to be that causes periodontitis um, is linked to dementia. Mm, yes. And, you know, I mean, linked can mean may not be linked as well. I understand right. that, but like, it, it's, it's quite scary to think that, right? That yeah everything is kind of you know one problem just leads to another leads to another leads to another you know it's all very connected same thing um they see a link between um people who get a periodontal disease and heavy uh build up in their mouth and cardiovascular disease too so you know and then alzheimer's there's always that interplay cardiovascular is it you know is there a component of cardiovascular with alzheimer's you know so yeah, it it's like one thing happening to the body and manifesting in all different areas, you know. And and I for some people, you know, it it ends up being type two diabetes, and then some, but you know, someone else, it's cardiovascular disease. And I I think it's the same thing, the same uh, source or sort uh, problem causing different issues. I mean, that's, you know, I'm not a doctor, but that's what I, I really think it, it's metabolic syndrome. It's um, carbohydrate overload. It's, you know, all these things playing to increase inflammation in our body. You know, if it's inflammation is in your mouth, then you're going to, you know, have periodontal disease. You know, if it's in your blood vessels, you're going to have heart disease. If it's in your brain, you know, have Alzheimer's and which, which Alzheimer's is also a big concern for, uh, for myself as well. My mother and grandmother both had early onset dementia. Like my mother, my grandmother was in her like late fifties when she started having signs of dementia. Yeah. And my mom was in her early sixties and, um, I'm in my early fifties, I'll be 54 this summer. And, that was one of the things I was dealing with too when I was having all this constellation of things happening is I could feel cognitively something was not right. And um, sometimes I'd be in my operatory at work and I would just stop and stand there and I wouldn't move. And I would like, like I'd have a, like a brain freeze and I'd just stand there and it, it was starting to scare me because that was my thinking is like, here we go. Here's my, here's my, where I start, you know, into falling into dementia you know i it's always been a big fear of mine and um and i really did feel like the cognitive thing was starting starting to start for me yeah that it's it's really scary whenever there's you know something that you just normally is just a natural thing and your brain just stops working in that way it's just really scary like you know, I've had moments where I've just forgotten something and I've been mid-conversation. I haven't been able to 
um, continue the conversation. And I've had, I had to like been floundering trying to change the subject in some way so it's not obvious that I've completely lost where I was. Mm. And fortunately, this is a long time ago and it hasn't happened recently, but it, it's really scary. Yeah. Really, yeah. Really scary. It was, yes, it was. I remember having a couple of bad episodes at work where I just wasn't thinking right. I could just feel my brain was not working right. And I like called my husband on driving home just to like, cause I was so scared. It was making me so nervous. I just needed to, to talk to him and um, tell him what was going on. And so I just knew I, I felt like, like it was, it was the beginning. So, um, but I haven't had anything like that. That has been, you know, I can really feel my brain feels clear and focused and sharp and, Oh, just so thankful for that. Nice. So if you could do, let's say you could do, you've you've got a patient in there that you can see they would really benefit from doing carnivore. And you can do like a 15-minute consult or a half an hour consult with them afterwards where you can talk about it and, um, you know, try and get them interested in doing carnivore. What would you say to them? Um, I usually start with um, whatever health issues they have. Um, so the tough part, I'll go back a little bit. The tough part is where I can give nutritional counseling. Um, I'm not really sure where that line is. When I, I was in hygiene school, our focus is on their oral health mainly, you know, how their diet is affecting their oral health. And I don't know how much of a line I am stepping over if I start talking about um, carnivore for their overall health. That being said, I still do it. <laughs> um, but in, in a very informal way, you know, like it's not part of their, um, their treatment. Um, I'm not actually, it's more of a conversation I'm having while I'm cleaning their teeth and chatting and letting them know, um, what I've been through, what health issues I've had and how, you know, what's happened and how it's helped. And I'll relate it to them. Like I said, the patient with the vertigo, you know, I told her I had vertigo. Um, and, you know, I get all different reactions. I get everything from very, very curious. I had one woman ask me to write down all the names of some, you know, some people to look for and some videos to watch. She seemed very excited um, all the way to, you know, yeah, I couldn't do that. You know, I one patient, he had rheumatoid arthritis. And I was telling him a little bit about it. And he goes, nah, he goes, I like beer too much. And I like pizza too much. And so he was out, you know, he's, so, you know, I get all, all over the board reactions, but I try, I try to go from where they are, whatever it is that they're dealing with, especially when they seem so um, desperate. Sometimes a lot of people come in and they're desperate, you know, and they're, on a lot of medications and you can see that it's, it's dragging them down. And that's usually will spark me to, to want to talk to them about it. And then of course you get the inevitable, but what about cholesterol? And, you know, the, so, so you got to go into all that. And, um, and I had my a blood work done back in October. So at that point I was, I think nine months, carnivore, nine, 10 months. And, um, all, everything was like wonderful spot on. I had my CAC score done, which was zero. Um, my triglycerides are, I think are 51. My HDL is over a hundred, but my LDL is high. So my total cholesterol was like in the four hundreds. And, um, so the doctor, I, he didn't even call me or talk to me. He just, I got a notification on my phone that the uh, pharmacy had a prescription for me to pick up. <laughs> and uh and i saw it was like uh, a stat and it started with an r i can't remember the full name but it started with an r and it was a statin and, and i laughed when i saw my phone and uh so i went on the portal and i saw in the portal he had said you know your cholesterol is very high I called you in a statin and i just sent him back saying my cac score is zero all my other numbers are are good I'm, I'm not taking the stat. And, and he, he was okay with it. He said, all right, we'll just keep an eye on it for now. Um, but I've learned I, I must be, you know, a lean mass hyper responder because I am, I'm lean. Um, I'm pretty um, athletic, you know, I'm um, 
and uh, I, I fit the the numbers criteria. I believe it's like if it's on if your triglycerides are under seventy five, and I, I can't remember the parameters, but I I think I fit into that. And uh, so I I follow a lot of Nick Norowitz's stuff on um, his his work on LDL and his Oreo cookie experiment and. Uh, Oh, that was really good. But that stuff, I do deep dives into LDL. I love watching like Dr. Paul Mason and um, anyone who's talking about um, LDL cholesterol. And I tell people, I'm like, it's it's an energy transport. I'm like, you know, trying to get into the whole scientific description of what it is. And I mean, I know I'm not in a position to 100% tell people, don't worry about it. But I, you know, I think as far as things we need to worry about for our heart health, it is way, way, way low on the list. Yeah. And, and I mean, the thing is as well, you know, um, we're, we're not qualified to be giving people advice, but we probably know more than the average doctor about it just because this has become so relevant to us, you know? Mm -hmm. Because I, I know I've sat in my in the doctor's office and just thought, hang on, I know more about this than you do mm. when he talks about cholesterol, you know, because he'll make recommendations and say, I think your cholesterol will go down if you do this. And I'm thinking, no, that's not right. My cholesterol will actually go up if I do what you're advising me to do. Mm. But, yeah, just bite my tongue. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm I've had that's another thing that's, you know, really been an eye opener too is understanding not to, you know, I know doctors they're they're good people and they're doing what they're they're supposed to, you know, that they know best or trying to do their best. A lot of it has to do with their training and their education and um but it's it was been frustrating to see that sometimes they don't still study beyond school. Like I remember somebody saying, you know, do you ever notice it's the um, it's called practicing medicine or studying medicine? It's, you know, I'm like, oh, it's you know, they're studying medicine, not health, you know, and uh, yeah, they're not they're not studying healing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and other times too, getting no answers. You know, like when I was going to a gastroenterologist for the IBS, they never had any answers for me. They never really asked me what I ate um much i mean I, I was given like a fodmap diet and um but their solution for me was um a anti-spasmodic pill that i would have to take before every meal so it'd like calm my digestive so I'd take it eat and then hopefully make my digestive system be calm and you know so the answer was a you know a medication that i would have to take three to four times a day and it just um, even then that was before I discovered carnivore, but even then I was just like, I don't understand why medicine is the answer. Why isn't finding out why this is happening? The answer, you know, and so that I've had a lot of frustration with, it just seems like you go to the doctor, you get a prescription, you go to the doctor, you get a prescription and there's no, um, curiosity to find out why you're experiencing that. And I always tell people our body's, um, natural state you know, a lot of people think our natural state is diseased. <laughs> like we just, you know, but our natural state, well, our body wants to be healthy. It wants homeostasis. It wants to, it wa it's wants to be healthy. It's, it's um, striving for that. So something has to be setting it off. Something has to be um, pulling it out of its ideal state. Yeah, uh, and that it makes perfect sense, you know. Why are we the only species that ends up with walking canes or or wheelchairs because we've got so, such bad arthritis or or whatever, you know? There, there's no other species that ha suffers this way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, except for the no. ones we, except for the ones we feed, you know. They exactly. Well, once we domesticate them, it's all downhill from there, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so, um, uh, Gina, do you have any um, way of reaching out to you? Do you have any social media or YouTube channel or anything? Um, I do have um, Instagram, which is uh, Camping Carnivore, kind of all one word. And a uh, YouTube channel, the same name. Um, I don't do, a, I'm trying to 
put more on there. Like I was kind of active for a few months ago, then I was quiet for a few months and then I just started putting some more stuff. I'm trying to put more stuff on there. I just figure um, I'm, I'm not going to get an audience like you have or, you know, big, uh, big viewership, but even if a few people watch it, it's that many more people who've seen someone else talk about it. You know, the more people are talking about it, it's better. So um, that's also the camping more as well. There's my dog. <laughs> um, well, I'll link, to, I'll link to your channel and the Instagram in the show. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story, Gina. I really appreciate your time. Oh, I appreciate you having me, and I appreciate everything you do. Thank you for what you do.